Hi guys, I'd like to uh, welcome you to my uh, first Twitch channel. Um, I was wondering if, I, if I'm setting up the, uh, the sound correctly because the music might be too loud. So just let me know if, uh, if it's too loud and I'm going to decrease the volume. So this show is about uh, want to focus my training. I want to share my training to you and trying to prepare uh, you know, to play tournaments and over the board and hopefully once the this pandemic is over so I um, I scheduled my uh, my practice every day uh, except Monday and whatever I'm doing that day I just want to share it to you and hopefully we can uh, learn from each other and just let me know if uh, you know, type your comments and let me know uh, what you think about the show as we go on. All right, so this position is from uh, it's a game between Axel Smith and uh, Nicola Sedlak. So what I'm gonna do first is is to um, to uh, increase my time. I mean, I'm gonna start the time. And Grandmaster Jacob Augard recommended at least 20 minutes. That's the maximum time that you want to be able to solve the uh, puzzle. So I'm gonna start the time now. All right. So 20 minutes to go. I'm trying to figure out here is first assess the position and and see what happens and then after we assess the position we try to figure out the candidate moves and calculate uh, from there we used to you know, we try to calculate uh, good moves and from what I remember when I was still uh, studying at Webster University my former coach uh, Susan Polgar defined strategy and tactics she mentioned that tactics is how you finish the op your opponent and strategy is how to build that advantage so you can get some tactics all right yes my wife is texting All right. Okay, we'll see. And oh, just bear with me. Uh, try to look at this puzzle because I'm trying to figure out if the um, if the music is fine because I have another account on Twitch and I want, I want to see. I want to hear if the sound is fine and the video is fine. So just try to bear with me. This is my first time that it's twitching. Let's see. Live.
Okay, I'm trying to paste the token login on my different Twitch account. Okay. Maybe the sound, the background music is still loud. Hello. All right. All right. So, what can we say about this position? So why does pair of bishops and and also has a very big center those d4 and c4 squares uh, pawns are controlling many squ many squares important squares like here 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 also why does space advantage so in general principle when if your opponent has a, a space advantage you want to exchange pieces because when you exchange pieces there then this the less piece that uh, you have um, uh, like a problem of trying to position uh, things uh, the analogy that Grandmaster Yasser Sarawan used in his book play winning chess is having many uh, chess pieces in in a cramped position is like uh, having a house with many people so like it's like a 20 people in a small house but what can you do if you can get rid of like those 20 people or like some people in a small house then you're gonna have like more space to move around so what do you think And this is also, it looks like a pawn structure from Slav or Karakan defense where there's uh, e6, this, this e6 and c6 that controls the d5 square and whereas white has this d4 and c4. So what now? What I'm, what I'm seeing is black has an idea to take the d4 pawn in exchange of in exchange for a pawn and, and a bishop. So black can sacrifice the exchange, but and and a trade-off is black is going to get the uh, dark squared bishops plus a pawn. Because if, for example, if you give white a chance, he might be able to play, uh, push the d-pawn and open this diagonal and take the knight and destroy black's pawn structure. 
So that's one of the uh, breakthrough for white that black has to watch out. So what happens after rook takes d4, bishop takes d4, then queen takes d4. I'm going to get a pawn and a bishop in exchange for rook. And also my queen is going to be well placed on d4 or, or not. Because if for example uh, my queen goes to d4, white most likely is going to play rook a to d1 with the idea of uh, bishop takes pawn then uh, rook takes the queen is discovered attack so those are the things that you want to calculate maybe after rook a d1 then the queen can go somewhere where it cannot be attacked with uh, like rooks Let's see. So what do you guys think? So let's see, rook takes d4, bishop takes d4, queen takes d4, and rook a d1, then I guess I have to move my queen, but where? Um, it's nice to have a battery on, on d4, like queen d4 then be followed by bishop g5, or even move maybe create a battery along this diagonal, the b8 to h2 diagonal. And let's say, just imagine it, the queen on c7, then the dark square bishop on b8, and that would be nice. Let's see, what else can we do? So after rook takes d4, bishop takes d4, queen takes d4, rook a to d1. White is threatening to take the pawn on h7 with a discovered attack against the black queen. So I have to move my queen, but where? Okay, maybe I can move my queen back to b6 with the idea of playing bishop to c5. And also play e5. Bishop c5, then transfer my bishop to d4. And you know, to so if because if I can transfer my bishop to d4, then I will be able to shut down white's rook, white's uh, white rook's d file. So that's a uh, that's a good idea. So one of the things that I do too when I train is um, I try to write down the moves and moves that I, I calculated during that uh, this 20 minutes line and after I solve the this problem I compare it to what is recorded in the book what the author of the chess book 
uh, records. And also, I check it with a computer you know, to error check and see if there are many mistakes that we can we can you know we can correct and check. Mm, and from what I am seeing is there there are not um, a lot of uh, forcing moves here. Uh, in this variation, it's more of okay. I exchange my rook for a pawn and a bishop. I get, I get a very good dark squared bishops. And now, where do I put my dark squared bishop to make sure that I make white's rooks useless? So I play like after rook takes d4, bishop takes d4, queen takes d4, rook a d1, um, then queen b6. And what can white do? Maybe g4. Then I think I can play h6. Oh no, I'm not maybe not h6 because if my opponent plays h6, then I mean if I play h6, then white white can play h4 and g5. Try to open up that g file. So after g4, what's going to happen? Ah, uh, I think I can play knight d7. No, oh, knight d7. Then they might. White might have that bishop takes h7 check, uh, followed by queen takes f7. So, back here, and followed by g4. I don't want to play e5 because white might play g5. Then if I go knight d7, for example, white has this queen f5, threatening to take the h7 pawn and take the knight. So, hmm, I don't know. Uh, it's too many lines. I'm going to delete all these colors. Too many color lines. Okay. So three minutes to go. can even play g6 after g4 because anyway my knight is defended on f6 then if g5 then knight d oh yeah yeah knight d7 with g6 what I like about the move g6 here what I like about move d6 here is black creates a wall in front of the light squared bishop it's like you're you're telling because if you put pawns in front of your opponent's bishop you lessen its uh, power so that's how you deal with uh, with a bishop you create a wall a wall of pawns in front of your uh, opponent's bishop maybe that's a good idea and now at least my bishop on d4 will be able you know has a uh, a home on g7 if it needs to retreat later 
Okay. All right. Oh, Coach Joel. Yeah, we, we have Coach Joel. Um, International Master Coach Joel Banawa. Welcome and thank you for watching. Why aren't this being shown on Leech's French page? Ah, I don't know. I'm supposed to. It's weird. It's kind of weird that it's not being shown on Leech's front page. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for letting me know. I will try to log in on Leech's. Uh, so I'm using a chess-based program, but I did register on Leech's. Hmm. Weird. Okay. Just gonna chess.org. Oops, okay. I'm just gonna ask this one. Hmm. Okay. So time's up. Let's see what happens. So my for me my answer is uh rook takes d four, bishop takes d four. Okay, let's see. Black to play. If I had played according to the author, um, Grandmaster Axel Smith. If I had played, Axel Smith here is white and Nicola Sedlock is black. Uh, Axel is rated 2503, Fide and uh, Sedlock is uh, rated 2549. And forgive me if I was not able to uh, pronounce it properly. Let's see. See. My computer is so slow. I'm trying to log in on, on leeches.org too. And hopefully I can log in and in leeches. I should be able to now show the stream on leeches homepage. Yeah. Huh. Okay. Well, anyway, we'll just focus on on the uh, on the game right now. So Axel Smith here is white, Grandmaster. He said that if I had played Rook E1 without exchanging knights, the D file would not be open for Black's Rook. The reason that I took on f6 was actually a bit embarrassing. It was quite far to the toilets at the Olympiad in Istanbul. Even running back and forth took 2 to 3 minutes. When Sadlock left the board, I saw my chance to earn a few minutes. Not only would his clock would be ticking, but I could also decide on my next move. While he was away, I, he came back after 5 minutes and he took back on f6 with the knight. I made my next move immediately. However, the consequences of my early exchange were bigger than I expected. So here, uh, Sedlak played rook takes d4. Takes. Did that. Fair exchange. It's no robbery. Both players were satisfied when I... Okay. When white played rook e1, he thought the disposition slightly better for white. Black does not have, have anything special in compensation for the exchange. Only a pawn in the opposite colored bishops. The problem is that white has a hard time finding a plan. It would be ideal to exchange rooks since I have two. Or to exchange off my light squared bishop. 
However, those plans are not achievable because black will not allow rook d8. And there is nothing to exchange the bishop for. Instead, white has to open more files for the rooks. It is difficult to do anything on the queen side since black controls the dark squares. And instead, white's best plan. Yes, I got this one correct because this is white's best plan to play g g to g4 to g5. Try to create um, some kind of counterattack on um, on the king side because here it's kind of hard if you if like for example white puts his a3 pawn on dark square and if you put your pawns like for example here if white puts there then this rook on a1 cannot leave uh, the a file otherwise the bishop is going to take that pawn so it's kind of hard for white to do some progress on the queen side but at least I was able to get it right that positional I haven't I haven't seen this one uh, I do this I try to do this strategical chess every uh, Tuesday uh, as my training because I believe that uh, um, I I didn't study a lot of strategical chess and most of my uh, former chess teachers grandmasters international masters freedom masters national masters candidate ma masters they didn't de they didn't teach me any um, um, strategical chess so that that's the problem when I was playing you know when I was younger and I was playing uh, junior in junior level in the Philippines you know it's it's, it's kind of easy for me because what I do is just attack my uh, my opponent and when I when I when I look at my old games um, that I played when I was younger, just I just may you know I try to play as aggressive as I can, attack them, and and you will see. I mean I I saw that they just collapse. You know they they have a hard time defending against my attack. But when I was playing here in the United States, and my rating was like twenty four hundred. It's still pretty easy against like 2200 uh, even 2300 to win just you know just bombard them with attack and try to find as many tactics as I can but I was playing against uh, let's say uh, international masters uh, uh, Andranik Matikosian, Grandmaster Malik Kachian and even Grandmaster Varujan Akobian it's hard because I had a hard time playing against them because they're very good positionally and I I know little about positional chess uh, during that time like 10 years ago 12 years ago so it's very good to do st this kind of uh, strategical I highly advise it especially young players young players they don't or or not unless they don't study strategical chess or positional chess unless their teachers are uh, the the teachers told them to do they insist on studying them that's why when I teach chess, I try to incorporate this first uh, before before even uh, helping them build their opening repertoire or end games. I want them, I want them, and I also want to learn how to assess this position and create some plans and improve my calculation. And that's my take. Another another good story is um, when and I was playing at Webster University. Uh, during that time, uh, I think to to I start I played at Webster University. Webster University as the before, or maybe until now was the best collegiate chess um, program. And during that time, our team A has uh, Grandmaster Wesley Saw, Grandmaster uh, Georg Mayer, uh, Grandmaster Lekong Lim, you know, I, I, I had many experience playing against them and, and it was fun. It's quite an honor to play against these strong players. And when I played them, even in Blitz, and, uh, and he let them, some of them, they let me attack. Um, then I, I attack, I attack all my might, I try to checkmate them. But whenever I attack, is they uh, defend my position. You know, they're very good in defending. So I was wondering like, wow, I mean, I thought these guys can only uh, defend, but they're also excellent defenders. So that's one of the things that, you know, the reasons why you want to do strategical chess. So you're not just one dimensional where you you can only attack, you know, hopefully you would know how to position your pieces properly. Anyway, 
go let's go back to the game uh, let's see white played queen a3 grandmaster axel smith played here uh, the best move is g4 but in the game white played queen a3 and black took no i didn't expect white uh, okay so that's why g4 was the best move because i i recorded g4 and I didn't even look at queen e3. Uh, okay, queen takes e3, f takes e3. What happens after here? Rook takes e3. Would be equal. Black's dark squared control on the queen side hinders white from opening files. And black also controls the entry squares on the d file. My last two moves have involved a queen exchange and a change in a pawn structure. Very critical moments, but I did not ponder much. Excuse me. I was blinded by the black's possibility to play bishop d4 followed by e5. If he is allowed to do this, the bishop will be at least as strong as one of my rooks, and I would be happy if I could sacrifice the exchange. The e5 square did not worry as much. In addition, I was happy that the queens came off. Something that is good news when an exchange up. Okay, yeah, he did exchange the queen. There are two reasons why decision this decision was terrible. The first is that it actually it is actually wrong in principle to exchange the last piece. Piece exchange the last piece that could defend the dark squares such as e5 and g5. Black has strategically justified play on the dark squares, which means that he increases his control with every exchange. It is good for white to reach the end game, but the problem is that a rook exchange is just a fantasy. That takes us to the second reason why f takes e3 was bad. It makes white's only plan to advance the kingside pawn. Yes, to, to advance this one and create some some kind of counterattack on the kingside, uh, and maybe uh, prevent black from moving, you know, the the this e pawn and um, the kingside pawns quicker okay it makes white's only plan to advance the king side pawns useless instead white has an e pawn that will never manage to exchange itself so rook, e rook takes e3 is, is okay f takes e3 what uh, grandmaster axel smith here as white did this terrible positional mistake okay bishop a3 wow look at this bishop to a3 because now um, one of white's uh maybe one of white's plan is to be able to play e3 followed by b4 then maybe b5 maybe because look white the white the rooks need d files and if the white rook doesn't have d files then it's kind of useless to have a rook it you know it's nice to have uh, it's better to have like a knight uh where it can jump around the squares or a bishop where this dark squared bishop where it just uh, it's like a beast on dark squared uh, pieces if without without files in good ranks your rooks are like um, they function less okay so bishop a3 said luck stops me from playing a3 a2 to b3 to b4 to create some counterplay in the post-mortem he, he was barely interested in seeing the rest of the game he simply evaluated this position as lost for white. Well, that may be a, a bit over the top, but black's position is at least clearly preferable. At this point in the game, it began to dawn on me what I had done, and I suddenly felt robbed. But exchange is exchange. I cannot b get back my dark squared bishop. Okay, rook ad1, king f8. Okay, try to, black is trying to get the black king close to the middle. Okay, if... For example, I black. What, from what I'm seeing here, black owns the dark squared bishop. Look, if we, for example, play fantasy chess, if I could move my king anywhere on the board, where would I put it? Maybe, I, maybe I'll put it um, somewhere like b2, where it can attack uh, the pawn, because I, I can, I know, I own the dark squared bishop. I have, I, I own the dark squares because because of my dark squared bishop. Maybe. Black has this nasty uh, maneuver where it could go to uh, b2 via via like uh, this dark square. So it's just me. 
Okay, king f8, bishop c2, king e7, rook d3. White threatens to play uh, b4. And yeah, to open the file, because without the file, white's rooks is, uh, is, it's kind of, you know, it's, it's not as good as when you have files. So a5, prophylactic, prophylactic move. So a prophylactic move is when you try to uh, prevent your opponent or slow down your opponent from doing something. And Grandmaster, uh, well, I'm not sure if it's a Grandmaster, uh, Sadlock played B, uh, saw that Smith here, white, is is trying to play b4 so a5 just kind of stops it for a while okay so rook e to d1 okay and also this is a prophylactic move because now black cannot play rook d8 and white is just gonna take that um the d8 rook so h5 another prophylactic move because here Maybe white can play g4, try to expand on, on the on the king side. After white after black played h5, then you know black white can play uh, g4 without losing a pawn. Alright? So here white played king f1. G3 was better. Black will try to win with g5 to g4. Yes, that's uh, what I just stated, followed by attacking the pawn on g3. But at least he's not clearly winning. Ah, g5 to g4. Okay, so not just white, not just w is white trying to play g5 to g4, but black is trying to play g5 to g4 to lock this pawn on g3 on the dark square. So uh, maybe later black can use this uh, powerful, like a beast, uh, dark squared bishop to to attack that pawn on g3. All right. So let's go back to the position, king f1, h4. Okay, now black was able to prevent, like to freeze this pawn on g2 uh, from moving because otherwise if white moves, then black can just take on g3. And also black was able to create an outpost. What is an outpost? An outpost is where you can put a... Um, uh, your your piece without getting attacked or kicked out by your opponent's pawn. So th this g3 would be a out nice outpost for uh, the knight, black's knight or black's bishop, h4. So black is looking good here. And notice that the knight on d7 not just is, you know, not just, it's not just dreaming to play to g3, but also it guards this d7 pawn. Um, d7 square from the white rook's invasion on, on the on the seventh rank. So the knight in f6 is doing an excellent job. Okay, king e2. I don't know where. Okay, maybe white is trending to go here. Then then push the pawn and create something. Kick the knight out. Then the rook can penetrate on d7. Let's see. Rook h8. Oh man, what is this move? Okay, from what I'm seeing is the rook, rook is trying to go here on h5, then here. Oh, it's quite a maneuver. Wow, look at this, a grandmaster move. Because maybe I can, if I'm black, maybe I'll play like g5 instead, then, uh, then rook g8. Rook g8 here, then try to open up the, uh, the g file, maybe. But rook h8, let's, let's see what is um, black up to. King f3, okay. Maybe white is uh, trying to expand on the, on the center. Bishop c5. Why? Okay, maybe black is bored. Uh, bishop on a3 was not as active as the bishop on c5. Okay, uh, repositioning your pieces to have a better control of squares. King f2. Okay, that now that's uh, on the dark square and white's pawn is pinned. When when a piece is pinned or a pawn is pinned, it's paralyzed. It loses its power because you cannot move the pawn and bishop bishops is attacking the uh, the um, the white king. Anyway, so g5. Okay, now this is the expansion that I was talking about earlier. 
King F3. Okay, Rook G8. So uh, this is crazy. The, the let's let's go back to Black's twenty uh, fifth move. This is one of the things that that it's very difficult to play as Black, especially. Oh, I mean, it's very difficult to play when you are white because what what's happening here is Black can waste move like Rook H8 do a waiting move and Rook G8, and Black is still better. See, he could have just played Rook G8 here right away oh no no here rook g8 right away and present white with you know telling white i'm gonna play g g5 followed by g4 opening the g file but instead he just like took his time and play rook h8 and see what happens and this is what a psychological move that uh, grandmasters do and masters know that you're telling your opponent whatever you do i'm still winning uh, i can't even waste move like rook h8 so this is you know some players do this to tell you like who's the boss in this position we shall see five here over there okay here okay here then here all right then white played rook three to d2 The decisive mistake simply miscalculating the variation that follows in the game in the game so the better move was uh, here g4 okay what now take take so after black takes white has an isolated pawn on h3 and an isolated means that there, there are no more um, it's isolated it's isolated from other pawns there are no more friendly pawns that can defend that pawn so it, it's easier to target those pawns when it's not isolated like connected pawns so h takes g3 here takes there with a clear advantage for black maybe i can play if i'm black hmm, i don't know maybe i can play here knight e4 position my i would play rook h8 here first so uh to prevent white from playing h4 maybe trying to figure out how to attack this h3 pawn with another piece after rook h8 because i cannot just take the pawn on h3 with just one piece so and also uh, i don't want to move my knight here hastily because like after check then just king just like for example king goes to um g2 or even here on f3 attacking the knight on e4 and after, for example, f5, then you kind of just let the uh, rook to go to d7. So I want to leave my knight here on, on f6 to prevent any uh, rook invasion uh, d7. That's gonna That might give a hope uh, against your opponent. So, okay, let's see. So g4 was better. Rook 3 to d2. So like a waiting move. Okay, so g4. H takes g4. Rook takes g4. Trying to play here. Rook e3 does an x-ray, attacking the um, king and the pawn on e3. What is going on in here? Takes here. Okay, so black can black just play king f8. If knight takes d7, king takes g4, then knight d7. Okay, I don't want to exchange my rook on g4 which is very active uh because right now after i, I move my king let's say king f8 and threatening to play rook g3 so i don't want to do exchanges and another an another um another oh uh oh yeah, okay there you go another prophylactic like strategical chess that you want to remember is when you're attacking you, you don't want to exchange pieces you want to maintain the pieces because if you exchange your pieces then you're not you're going to have less attacking pieces so when you're attacking don't exchange pieces now when you're when you're defending like here as white you want to exchange pieces another good positional um uh, uh advice that that you want to remember and I remember this one. Uh, I I only learned that positional uh, tips when I was already at Webster University. I was already in FM, uh, and I was watching uh, this video uh, created by Grandmaster Jesse Cry, and he created a wonderful 
um, uh, series on chess lectures that compositional chess and I just uh, I just uh, when I'm you know I'm, when I'm resting uh, taking my time after studying hours multiple hours for my accounting test because I was trying to finish my bachelor's degree in accounting and my master's degree in accounting and I still have to play uh, you know Pan American chess and some chess open in uh, just in, at Webster University playing against grandmaster so I, I have to prepare something I know I have to get better in chess so when I'm resting what I did was I watch videos checks that chess lectures dot com and grandmaster Jesse Cry mentioned this principle like that's the only time that I learn about this principle when you're when you're attacking doing exchange pieces when you're defending exchange pieces like I was right in FM <laughs> so I should have I wish I should have learned that um, earlier where I could have uh, beaten more uh, masters and strong players but anyway it's still good to know that than later where uh, you know you're playing in a very important tournament with a bigger price so okay King F8 the rest is easy as it, it is painful Rook takes b7, Rook g3, King e2, Rook takes g2, King d3, and okay, time to promote my pawn here. Okay, maybe play here, bishop b4, no? Let's try to, I'm trying to annoy the, uh, the white king. Okay, here, trying to play there, then promote the pawn. Okay. Let's prevent it's a prophylactic move to prevent black from playing from queening uh, from playing rook g1 and then the queen okay take okay maybe i have this idea now knight g4 with a knight f2 okay see that's a prophylaxis move to prevent uh to prevent the black knight from going to g4 but can i play like knight e4 here then king d3 the knight f2 in things yeah i think i can play knight e4 no knight e4 king d3 knight f2 king takes e3 knight takes h1 okay maybe that's still winning but here black played uh, he took his time again with bishop f4 to defend that pawn king d3 rook d2 check oh the sad king has to go back to c3 and now knight e4 oh it's a checkmate oh my goodness wow so white got checkmated in um in a position where there are many pieces but no queen wow it is fitting that white's king has four dark squares to choose between but all of them are covered the strength sacrifice showed its full strength when there were opposite colored bishops on the board so hopefully this is a, a, a good example positional chess uh, example i mean i i learned a lot uh, it's a the, I think the topic here is exchange sacrifice or exchanges. Well, what are good and bad exchanges? And here, when black has, well, when black exchanges its rooks, its rook to d4. Here, and black has, um, black got better, uh, the better deal than white. And okay, so I think that's for today. Uh, hopefully, this would help you to. Uh, you know to to have a better knowledge about positional chess and um, if you like this video don't forget to subscribe and share this to your uh, to your friends and also check out my website my Facebook and twitch and subscribe to my YouTube channel and twitch and I'll see you guys next time and bye bye Oops. There you go.